About a thousand years after the Jews were liberated from Egypt, Rome takes them over. So we're going to talk about what, what did Judaism look like at this time and, and how did Rome treat them. The first thing you need to understand is what did the Romans want from the Jews? They just wanted three things. They wanted money. They wanted to pay taxes. They didn't want any problems. They didn't want any rioting or uprisings or, or dissent or treason or anything. And then the third thing that they wanted was they wanted support from the Jews. And that meant worshiping their gods. Remember Augustus made the law saying that you can worship any god you want, but you have to worship the Roman gods as well. Well, the Romans quickly found out how difficult this was going to be. Um, every time the Romans tried to force the Jews to worship their gods or try to turn um, their temple into um, a Roman temple by putting Roman gods inside their temple, there was huge uprisings and riots and, and just these massive fights. So eventually the Romans said, look, we understand that your religion is so old, it's older than ours, that we're going to make an exception for you. That you don't have to worship our gods, but you have to do one and you have to do two. Meaning you have to pay taxes and you can't riot anymore. You have to just calm down. So they make quite a few exceptions for the Jews. Um, but wherever the Jews go, they're kind of seen w with suspicion because they're still the guys that don't worship the Roman gods um, and people don't quite understand why not. They don't understand what, what the problem is. Let's talk about the different groups of Judaism. First let's talk about Sadducees. Um, Sadducees are cooperating with the Romans and it's the Sadducees that the Romans put um, in government positions. One unique thing about the Romans is when they took over Judea or the Jews, they pick Jews to rule over them. And mostly they, they pick from the Sadducees. So they're the upper class, they're, they're extremely knowledgeable of the Jewish law, and they try to obey the Jewish law as closely as possible. Then we have the Pharisees, who are very similar to the Sadducees, except they want to liberate Judea from Roman control. They, they don't like the Romans at all. So the Sadducees and Pharisees are similar in the fact that they're obedient and also um, they're educated in kind of the upper class. However, the Pharisees um, want to get rid of the Romans and the Sadducees are, are working with them. How I remember that is the Pharisees were fair to the Jews. Now when I say that they're obedient to Jewish law, you hear stories of... Um, them going to extreme lengths to stay obedient to Jewish law. For instance, during the Jewish Sabbath, you you weren't supposed to work. So it said that some Pharisees would actually count their steps on the Sabbath to make sure they didn't walk too far. Um, I even heard a story of of, uh, of some Pharisees that wouldn't walk on grass because it was against Jewish law to plant or harvest on the Sabbath and they're worried that they might accidentally plant a grass seed if they're walking on grass, so they avoided that. So that gives you a sense of how strict these guys are, um, trying to follow Jewish law as closely as they can. And then we've got the zealots. These are the warriors. These are the guys that arm themselves, that hide up in the mountains and the hills and bushes and wait for Roman legionnaires to pass by and they jump out and they kill them. These guys are the fighters and they will overthrow the Romans by any means necessary. Then there's this other group that are are waiting for the Messiah to come. What the Messiah is is the Son of God and they were expecting the Messiah to do certain things for them. One is to free the Jewish people from the Romans similar to what Moses did for them by liberating them from the Egyptians, bring the kingdom of God, meaning basically replace Caesar and sit a, at his throne and, and rule uh, the empire. The other thing is they're expecting him to establish true paradise on earth. Now think of that. Christians today would say that Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus didn't really do any of those things. 
So by by many Jews he was seen as a fake messiah because he didn't fit their expectations. On the next video we'll talk about why he was accepted by some and why even though he went against these three things um, he's still seen as a messiah. So j just one more time they're expecting God to liberate them just as he did from Egypt by sending a messiah who will fight for them and will do something similar to what Moses did with the ten plagues pardon of the Red Sea that the messiah would come and literally take out the Romans um, with the power of God. So now let's talk about Jesus. How does Jesus fit in here? As historians, it's hard to tell um, a lot about Jesus. The only place where, where we find a lot of information about him is the Bible. There, there's few outside sources, reliable outside sources, other than the Bible that we can go on. So historians will actually read the Bible, and they'll look for things. Um, there's the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the four Gospels, um, not, not all of them are exactly the same. And so they'll look for what they all have in common, and then they'll look at that, and then they'll compare that to archaeological evidence at the time. And then the bottom line is they will guess. So let's go with the for instance here. Um, here's a picture of Jesus as a carpenter. The Bible says he was a carpenter. Now historians, they read that. Um, then they compare that to archaeological evidence. And the archaeological evidence at the time says that where Jesus supposedly lived, there was a lot of stone masonry or stone work carving. And so some historians will say that the Bible says he's, he's a carpenter. The archaeological evidence says that he was probably a stone mason. So they, they, they guess, right? Does that mean Jesus was a stone mason? Well, no. We, we don't know. They're guessing. But it is an educated guess. So, so that's kind of the pattern that historians will go through. Um, in order to make their assumptions about Jesus and about his life. But even in the Bible, there's certain time periods of Jesus' life that nothing is written about him. They're called basically the dark years of Jesus, where we don't know what he did. And so historians have made all sorts of guesses about, about his life. Um, so anyway, that, that's just a pattern that historians go by. Lots of people hated Jesus. Um, if he wasn't hated, he would have been killed, right? So let's talk about who hated him and why. His most powerful enemy was actually Rome. It was Rome that killed him. Um, they hate him because they're worried of, of him forming a kingdom. He talks about forming a kingdom. Uh, there's people that call him king. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, the Roman governor Pilate asks him, you know, are you the king? Are you a king? Um, when he's crucified, according to the New Testament, they put above him on the cross, King of the Jews. So the fact that people called him king or that he called himself king is a big deal because there's only one king in Rome, and that's Caesar. And if anyone calls himself king, that's treason. Um, now Christians would say that he was building the kingdom on the left, not on the right. So if you look at these pictures, the Christians would say that he was building a kingdom in heaven, not an earthly kingdom. Um, and the, the Bible quotes Jesus as, as saying some similar things to that. But it doesn't matter. The Romans hear king, they think treason. Kind of ironically, the zealots don't like him because he's not violent enough, that he doesn't want to overthrow the Romans using violence and establish that kingdom. Many see him as, as a fake Messiah. One, because he never liberates them from Roman rule. That's really what they're expecting the Messiah to do. And Jesus is not unique in the fact that he calls himself Messiah. There are several leaders during this time period that call themselves Messiah. Almost all of them die violent deaths. So, so Jesus isn't unique in the fact that he dies in the way that he does. Um... Normally, though, when, when these uh, messiahs 
uh, die, their movement dies with them. Because obviously the Messiah couldn't be killed by the Romans. That, that's just not what they were expecting. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the Christian point of view of this on the, on the next video. The Sadducees and the Pharisees don't like him because he goes against Jewish tradition and Jewish law. Remember, these are, are the guys that are strictly obedient to Jewish law. So let's see how he goes against it. Uh, Jesus taught that the Ten Commandments were not enough to get into heaven. Um, out of the Bible it says, You have heard it said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, adultery is basically cheating on your wife or sleeping around. So, what what Jesus is reportedly of, of, of said, saying was that you're going to be judged by your actions and also your thoughts. So he's taking the Ten Commandments and he's adding on to it. He's taking it to the next level. Here's one that says, You have heard it said, um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, do not resist one who is evil, but if one strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That means if someone knocks my tooth out, uh, Jewish tradition was that I could knock his tooth out by law. There's some places in the world that still do this. Um, I just heard on the on the news a couple days ago where, and I can't remember what country this was in, but a man threw acid in a woman's face. And so they have an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth in that country. So she's asking the court and the government to throw acid in his face. But Jesus reportedly said that th that's not what you're supposed to do, that you're supposed to be tolerant, you're supposed to forgive people. Another thing is he goes against Roman values. Take a minute and look at that list. Does Rome value any of those things? No, they don't. Um, in fact, Christianity is seen as the anti-Rome. And so when people are getting sick of Rome, they turn to Christianity to feel better. So again, Jesus angers a lot of people, um, and in the end... He's killed, but let, let's talk about specifically why he gets arrested and why he gets killed. Jesus reportedly goes to uh, Jerusalem during the Passover. The Passover is a huge celebration for the Jews. Picture New York City, New Year's Eve for a week. And that gives you a sense of, of what the Passover would have felt like. Remember, during the Passover, they are celebrating their liberation from Egypt. So obviously the Romans are a little on edge here because here is a group of their subjects that are, are celebrating when they were liberated a thousand years ago by God. So things are ripe uh, to go bad for the Romans. Um, that there might be a riot. And if there is a riot, they need to stop it as soon as possible. They're going to be looking for any small thing that might start the riot and then just stopping it. If we go by the New Testament, Jesus goes there and he's, and he's welcomed by large crowds. We don't know how large his following actually was. One of the first places he goes to is the temple. And according to the New Testament, he kicks people out of the temple that he feels isn't doing what, what they're supposed to do. The account in the Bible also says that he literally whips people out of the temple. So obviously he's getting the attention of the Romans. Um, he then talks about how the temple is going to be destroyed. Now Christians would say that he was predicting the destruction of the temple in 70 AD by the Romans. Uh, Christians can also say that he was predicting his own death by referring to his body as a temple. Um, it didn't matter to the Romans. They heard that the temple is going to be destroyed, and here's this guy pushing people out of the temple. He's causing some problems. And they're already on red alert. This would be the equivalent today. If I went into the airport, and I start shoving people around, and I, and I start talking about how a plane's going to blow up, how long do you think it's going to take for me to get arrested? I don't think it's going to be very long. And it didn't take Jesus very long to get arrested. So the Romans arrest him, and he is crucified by the Romans. 
on, on the next video, we're going to talk about um, why Jesus is unique as far as his movement. Because there was other messiahs, but once they died, their followers were either arrested and were killed with them. Um, they either gave up or they found a new messiah to follow. Why Jesus is unique and why we're talking about him today is that his followers kept the movement going. In fact, they said that he visited them and that he actually came back to life and was resurrected. On the on the next video, we'll we'll get the Christian point of view and we'll talk specifically about Peter and Paul, the leaders of the Christian movement.